Hi everyone, welcome back. Last time we saw how risk, liquidity and tax considerations can influence interest rates and we called that the risk structure of interest rates. We see that bonds with identical risk, liquidity and tax considerations may have very different interest rates. This main difference over here is arising because of the differences in their term to maturity. So short term bonds will have a different yield compared to long term bonds or intermediate term bonds. We can plot the yield of these bonds with varying maturities on a diagram and we call this plot our yield curve. So on my x axis I have the term to maturity so it could be varying from some months to many number of years and on my y axis I have the yield on a particular bond. So we are starting with very short term bonds over here and then medium and then long term bonds. For now I can say this is 1, 5 and 10. Now if your yield on short term bonds is lower than yield on long term bonds you will have an upward sloping yield curve. If your yield curve is, if your yields on your short term bonds are the same as your intermediate and long term bonds then your yield curve is flat and lastly your yield curve could also be inverted and in this case your yield on short term bonds is a lot higher than yield on long term bonds. So the plot over here will give you a downward sloping yield curve. So yield curve can have all of these different shapes. Sometimes a yield curve can also be U-shaped or inverted U's and we will now look at some actual data to see what type of yield curves do we see. So here I have a timeline of Government of Canada bonds. We, they all share the same risk characteristics in terms of risk of default, in terms of their liquidity and in tax considerations. So their overall structure is the same. However, they have varying times to maturity. I have your short term three T bills in the dark green. We have your long term bonds, which are in your red. And then you have your intermediate term bonds, three to five year averages. As you can see, the yield on these bonds for any given year are not the same. So I'm roughly over here in 1973. Yield on my short term bond is a lot lower than the yield on my long term bond. So we can take a particular point in time and plot the yield curve for that particular year. So in 2007, we have a, almost a flat yield curve. All the three yields are converging together. I could draw another yield curve for let's say 2010. Here your yield for short term bonds is very low compared to the yields on your intermediate and long term bonds. And here your yield curve will become very steep. If I look at another time period, let's say the early 80s, 81, your yield curve is actually inverted because your yield on your short term bond is a lot higher compared to the yield on your long term bond, the one in red. So we have an inverted yield curve. We have a flat yield curve over here in 2007 and in 2010 we had an upward sloping yield curve. Some observations that we should make when we look at this data over here is that yield curves do not remain the same. So yield curves, yield curves do change over time. Another thing to notice over here is that interest rates tend to move together even on bonds with varying maturities. So if short term rates are rising, meet intermediate and long term bonds rates are also rising. If yields on short term bonds are a constant, yield on your long term bonds are typically also roughly moving in the same direction. So interest rates on bonds with varying maturities tend to move together. Another thing that we noticed was that if your short term interest rates are very low, like in your 2010, right after the financial crisis, long term yields are going to be much higher, giving you your upward slope of the yield curve. Conversely, if your short term yields are very high, like we saw in 1981, yield curve tends to become downward sloping or becomes inverted because long, long term yields are, were now quite low. Lastly, we saw that most of the time yield curve tends to slope upward. So where yes, we do have flat yield curves and inverted yield curves, but for most of the given years, your yield curve will come out to be upward sloping, telling us that your short term yields are lower than your long term yields. Where I1 is representing my yield on a one year bond and INT is representing my yield on a long term bond, N year bond today. How do we explain the, these three facts about the term structure of interest rates? We have different type of economic theories which explain all of these three facts. We can start an analysis with the expectations theory. 
Then we'll move on to the segmented market theory. And lastly, we'll bring these two together and form our liquidity premium theory, which is the most comprehensive tool for explaining the interest rate movements for bonds with varying maturities. Expectations theory is a very simple idea. All it's saying is that the interest rate on a long-term bond is simply equal to the average of the short-term yields that people expect to occur over the lifetime period of this bond. The key assumption over here is that people do not prefer bonds of one maturity over another. So you do not have any preferences for short-term bonds over long-term bonds or vice versa. So all you care about is the expected return that you get. If your expected return for a particular type of bond is less than the expected return on an alternative asset, you will never hold that particular bond and you will put all your money in the bond which is giving you the higher expected return. Remember, we are now comparing bonds with different types of maturity dates. In order for me now to hold some amount of both of these type of securities, the expected return for both of them should be identical. So they must equal. Now the key thing to remember over here is that I have two options. I can invest in a one year bond today and reinvest it again in a one year bond one year from now. And the other option is let's assume that I have a two year bond so and I invest my dollar in a two year bond today and hold it for two years. Each option gives me some expected return. So let's call it expected return one and expected return two. I'm getting a nominal interest rate of I1 over here and I'm getting some expectation of short term bond one year from now. Whereas in option two, I'm getting the interest rate of a two year bond I2 today. So now if my expected returns are both are going to be identical because the bonds are perfect substitutes, I have no inherent preference for one bond over the other. With some math manipulation, we end up getting that your interest rate on a two year bond today is exactly the same as the average of the short term bond and its expectation over the lifetime period of this bond. And in this case, the lifetime period of the longer bond was two years. So you can see we are only looking at the short term bonds current interest rate and its expectation over the next year taking the average and it gives us our yield on a two year bond. We can apply this formula now to determine the interest rate on a long term bond with pretty much any year to maturity. So if it's 10 years, I will look at the interest rate on a one year bond and its expectation over the remaining nine years and then take the average over the total number of periods, which is 10 in this case. And we can therefore apply it to all terms to maturity. In our standard practice, let's look at our notations. Your I1T is reflecting the today's interest rate on a one year bond, which is my short term bond. The I1T plus one with an expectation over here. This is the expectation that you have what the interest rate on a short term bond will be one year from now. Likewise, if I have INT, this is reflecting the interest rate on a bond during in N years today. We can apply our standard formula that in interest rate on a long term bond is simply the average of the actual and the expectation of the short term bond over the lifetime period of this bond. These I's are all interest rates associated with a one year bond. So I should have one over here. So based on the actual and the expectations of the short term yields, we can take the average and get our yield on a long term bond today. Let's do an example. Let's assume the current interest rate on a one year bond is 6%. Now you expect the interest rate on the one year bond to be 8% next year. So in terms of my notations, I1 is expected to be 8% one year from now. If a one year bond and a two year bond are perfect substitutes of each other, the interest rate on my two year bond today is simply this average. Average of the interest rate on a one year bond and the expectation of the one year bond one year from now. So based on expectations hypothesis, the interest rate on a two year bond must be at least equal to 7% in order for you to be induced to hold it today. If it's anywhere below 7%, you will not hold the two year bond and only want to invest your money in the one year bond. In my second example, I have the current one year bond yield as 5% and now I'm expecting it to rise to 7% the next year and then 8% the year after. So this question gives us an opportunity to calculate the yield on both a two year bond and then three year bond. 
interest rate on a two-year bond today is simply the average of the current yield on a short-term bond plus its expectation over the next time period and that gives you 6%. Yield on a three-year bond today is the average of the current yield on a short-term bond today and its expectation over the next remaining number of years and this gives you 6.67%. And that's your yield curve for this question. Let's do another example. In this one, my current yield is 5% and I'm expecting my one year bond rate to remain at 5% for the remaining next few years. So the year after and then the subsequent year. So the interest rate on the one year bond today is 5% and let's calculate it now for a two year bond today. And that gives you 5%. Likewise for my yield on a three year bond today, So this again is 5%. So this is a very interesting outcome. If I was to draw my yield curve for my one year bond, two year bond and three year bond, in this case, my yield curve is flat at 5%. So if I'm expecting short term yields to not change, yield on long term bonds is also not changing. If I'm expecting short term yields to go up, my yield on long term bonds was also rising and gave me an upward sloping yield curve in my first example. Expectations theory is a great theory for explaining the term structure of interest rates. It's firstly, it explains to us why interest rates change at different Different times. As you saw in my example, if my expectations are changing, my yield curve will also change. If my expectations are changing, my yield curve will also change. Another thing that the expectations theory explains is why the interest rates on varying maturities tend to move together. In our example, if we were expecting short term yields to go up, since long term yields are based on the average of short term yields, these will also automatically go up. If I'm expecting my short term yields to stay constant, not change, then my long term yields are also not changing. So they're also pretty stable. If I expect my short term yields to go down, since long term yields are again based on averages of my expectations of short term yields, long term yields will also go down. Lastly, expectations theory also very nicely explained why yield curves become steep when short term yields are very low and they become inverted when short term yields are very high. So note, if your central bank drastically reduces the interest rate today, if people expect it to be a temporary measure, they know in the long term yields will eventually start to go up and therefore the average will also reflect that. So your yield today is low, but long term yields are quite significantly higher because you're expecting short term yields to eventually rise and that gives you your steep upward sloping yield curve. Conversely, if the central bank drastically increases your short term yields, so contractionary monetary policy. If people expect that this is not a sustainable scenario and eventually short term yields will go down, that will cause your long term averages to be actually lower than the current yield today. And therefore, your long term average is a lot lower than the current yield on a short term bond today. And that gives you your inverted yield curve. So expectation theory not only explains why interest rates tend to move together on bonds with varying maturities, it tells us that when expectations change, the yield curves will also change. So they have different forms. They can be flat, steep or downward sloping. And then lastly, what causes the steep upward shape or the inverted yield curve? One thing that the expectations theory missed out on was the fact that why do yield curves tend to be usually upward sloping? So in my time series data that I showed you earlier, there were very few time periods in which we had inverted yield curves, maybe two, but most of the time your yield curve is upward sloping. It doesn't give us any answer to why generally yield on long term bonds today are higher than short term bonds today. So this fact is still inconclusive. So in order to see why are yields on long term bonds generally higher than yields on short term bonds, we will look at the segmented market theory. So segmented market theory is just going back to your demand supply framework. As you know, and from chapter four, that bonds with longer terms to maturity have lower present value. And also we saw in chapter four that with longer terms to maturity, there is higher interest rate risk. There are bigger fluctuations in prices of longer term bonds than in your shorter term bonds when interest rates go up or down. So there are, there are bigger exposure to interest rate risk. And in order to be compensated for this interest rate risk, bondholders would always want to be compensated by a higher yield on a long term maturity compared to a short term maturity. So segmented market theory 
is simply going back to your demand supply analysis because they have an interest rate risk demand for long-term bonds is lower so let's say d1 is your demand for short-term bonds and dn is your demand for long-term bonds because they're associated with interest rate risk with lower demand price for a long-term bond is lower today and with price being lower today yield on a long-term bond is higher than the yield on a short-term bond therefore segmented market theory very nicely demonstrates why yield curves are mostly upward sloping which was our fact three when we were observing the term structure of interest rates now independently segmented market theory explains one fact while the expectations hypothesis explain the other two facts so far we have not come across an economic model which explains all three facts that we saw for our term structure of interest rates. 